Capital Report is a production of Senate Media Services. From the great Minnesota get-together, we'll talk with senators at the State Fair Senate booth. We'll also hear the arguments before the state's highest court on Governor Dayton's line-item veto of legislative funding. All this and more on this State Fair edition of Capital Report. Welcome to this week's program, I'm Shannon Lurkey. We're here at the Senate booth at the Minnesota State Fair where I had the opportunity to speak with senators about some uniquely Minnesota topics. I asked each lawmaker a series of questions beginning with, what's the number one distinguishing factor that makes Minnesota unique? What makes Minnesota unique are lakes. Everywhere you go throughout the country, uh, when, they, I, when they think of Minnesota, they think of our lakes. And the big thing is I, they, they'll say, do you really have 10,000 lakes? And I would say, no, we have 15,297 lakes, 10 acres or larger. The Minnesota State Fair, certainly uh, it is the best state fair, I believe, in the country. I don't think any other state fair uh, compares with it. The outdoors, people come up here to fish, to vacation, to camp from all over the country and they recognize it for that, whether it's summer or winter. Winter, we don't get a lot of visitors, but you know, it's still a, still a place people come and recognize it for the winter anyway. I was talking to a gentleman on the phone the other day, and he was trying to settle my, uh, my uh, storm damage claim. We we're talking about ice, uh, ice shields, and he wanted to question. I said, we live in Minnesota. We need ice shields. So the outdoors, our, um, our uh, lakes, and the environment, that's uh, our resources. That's what people, I think, really distinguish the state. Number one, it's quality of life. And then you could list every news article and magazine article that's there that has come out from Forbes to USA Today to CNN. Quality of life, Minnesota, number one. And, and, and within that comes education. We, we have the premier education system, I think, in the country and still to this day. And we continually talk about improving that. Well, I think it's the work ethic that Minnesotans grow up with. I was born on, uh, on a farm, actually grown, born in Glencoe, took home to my grandparents' farm when I was left the, left the hospital, stayed on, their, on a trailer on the grandparents' farm for a number of years, and you develop a work ethic. When I was older, and I'm generally not as strong as I used to be, but when I was a kid, I was loaned out to the farmers for uh, baling alfalfa, and second cut alfalfa, there's nothing hotter in the world than second cut alfalfa. So, uh, you know, you learn that work ethic that's within you, and that's what I, and it's also a rugged independence that Minnesotans have, and they, all, they don't always march to the same drummers. So I think all of those really make Minnesotans unique. I would say that it's primarily our natural resources and the um, opportunities we provide for people to, to participate in outdoor activities like uh, everything from fishing and um, biking to uh, hunting to um, you know skiing and people really like to be outdoors in Minnesota. If Minnesota had one state recognized pastime, what would it be? Going to the lake, spending time at the lake um, is the number one pastime. We actually have more boats per capita than the coastal states and so we are very lake oriented, uh, water oriented kind of a state. Uh, I think that's really fun. We have some grandkids that moved to Ohio and Anna said one time, I gotta find a lake. I need to go to a lake. <laughs> and there's no, almost no lakes in Ohio. I think fishing, if you think about Minnesota, you think about our lakes and, and the pristine waters that we have and our constant conversation about what type of fisheries we have. And, and you know, it could be a lengthy debate on muskies. I mean, we got, you know, we have people coming from all over the nation to fish our waters for, you know, to try to get a trophy fish, and it's catch and released. Probably fishing. Uh, when you look at how people uh, take that, uh, especially on opening day, uh, it's, a, it's a zoo of boats going all over the place. I think it's taking care of our people. I, we're, we're really known for that, is that we've always had one of the best uh, health care systems, one of the best uh, uh, rehabilitation systems. We were known for our treatment community, uh, uh, and we're starting to come back around to having a decent uh, treatment system. I love baseball. I, it's something that's been around for over 100 years, well over 100 years, um, 150 years. and. 
it's changed a little bit, but there's a lot of thinking to the game. It can be slow at times, but beautiful parks, beautiful ballparks, anybody can do it. I have to choose my own favorite one, and, and that is baseball. <laughs> um, I, uh, I and my family have been baseball fans our, our whole lives, and uh, we are uh, so appreciative that Minnesota uh, supports Major League Baseball as well as um, of all the town teams. You know, Minnesota, I think, is actually pretty unique in that, too, of having such a strong um, tradition of town team uh, baseball or slow pitch or whatever it is that they're, they're going to play. For Minnesotans looking to travel in the state, why should they visit the district you represent? Our district, uh, it's, it's a diverse district. It's part rural and part urban. So you can go up to the northern part of my district and they're planting growing corn and raising dairy cows. Uh, on the other end of the district, we have uh, more of an urban metropolitan environment where they can uh, eat and shop. In Brooklyn Center, Brooklyn Park, we're a, we're a bedroom community. And I think it's just gorgeous because we have all these really mature trees and it's, it's, it's so pretty, you know, like some areas, the newer divisions have the younger trees, the smaller, but it's, um, there's like a canopy of, of uh, trees of all types in our um, area. And then we just redid the, uh, it was the old Brookdale and we have the Shingle Creek Crossing, which has uh, everything from uh, TJ Maxx to Michaels to, Caribou, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of a, it's a destination again. Well, I have this really unique body of water called Lake Minnetonka. And uh, there was a Prince movie where he had to, be, in order to be a true rock star, you had to baptize yourself in the, the waters of Lake Minnetonka, so to speak. And the girl did it. And when I saw that scene, I went, she's not, she didn't even have to, Prince didn't even have to say it. I knew that wasn't Lake Minnetonka because there's no way somebody's going to get away with, with skinny dipping on Lake Minnetonka without somebody knowing it. So uh, Lake Minnetonka is probably the biggest asset, regional asset that I have. My district is the, um, the western suburbs and I, uh, um, uh, I believe that in my, in my own city we have um, a lot of amenities. We have a wonderful park system and um, we have a community pool. Um, we have a dog park, um, we have, um, uh, in, for the first time in, since I've lived there for a sustained period of time, we even have a grocery store. Mississippi River, we have the most beautiful body of water in the state, and, and I mean that in the sense of, you know, we have a seven mile uh, 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 waterway right there that shares the three communities that I serve, Coon Rapids, Chapel, and, and uh, Brooklyn Park. And if you look at Champlin, for example, the mill pond, to come see the restoration of the mill pond and the dam that we put in, it, it got an award for, for the architecture that is there. Well, my district has two really good things going for it. Uh, number one, up in Sherburne County, so half of my district is in Sherburne County, we have the Sand Dunes uh, Wildlife Refuge, uh, a great unknown, sometimes almost a secret, but it is sand dunes, so you usually think of forests or you think of other mountains or things, but these are sand dunes, a very unique culture, very, very unique culture, and it's in Sherburne County. Uh, so you just come to Elk River, go north to 169, and it's just off in that area, very unique. And then in the other part of my district, gotta, gotta be fair to both sides, <laughs> we have the Albertville Outlet Mall. So we're really known for that. The State Fair is one of the premier showcases for Minnesota culture and products. If you could add one feature, what would it be? I don't see as many boats out here that, that are for sale. A lot of that, we have the boat shows. Uh, I don't see a lot of boats out here. You got a lot of tractors and a lot of farm machinery. Uh, but you know what? If we had something that might be missing, and frankly, I don't think we really do, uh, I think we'd probably see a few more boats out here because I think it's a great place for people to buy a boat. I think if we could add a little more of the manufacturing side. I know we have the tractors and things, but there is tremendous medical device, uh, manufacturing. Uh, in my district, they have a company that builds machines to cut with water called Jet Edge. Uh, we have other companies, they've been on Modern Marvels twice, but they haven't been in the state fair. I mean, they're phenomenal. So I think because Minnesota really a lot, does a lot of manufacturing, 
but because we're more known for our agriculture and our lakes somewhat, that manufacturing side I don't think is promoted as much as they could. What's missing here is a bowling alley, an outdoor bowling alley. Think about it, right? Now, folks have talked about an outdoor skating rink, but you know, we get enough winter year round, right? But is there any bowling around here? You see the plastic pins out all over the place with, let's put a real, real lifetime bowling alley outdoor. And then it, next to that, we should put an outdoor bocce ball court. We should have like a, a real live bocce ball court out there. I think there should be a um, venue that uh, is dedicated to our Native Americans. I think that we should have, uh, it should have like the history of all the different um, tribes that have been here over time and how they are now and what their needs are. And you know, they don't belong in the international section, which is where they put them now. And uh, I think they should have their own uh, area. I would like to see more emphasis placed on um, clean water. Uh, the governor right now has a number of initiatives on it. Minnesota is known as the uh, state of 10,000 lakes. We know we have more than that. Um, we're on the shores of Lake Superior. I would like to see in the education building, as a matter of fact, um, a lot more information about how Minnesotans as individuals can contribute to a clean water culture. See, I challenge that question because <laughs> you cannot make this better. This is almost perfect. State Fair is a quintessential Americana. People from all walks of life come here to enjoy the fair. It is good because it's been around for a long time. It is good because it connects people to the past. They come here, they can see the past. They can see the future. And people from all walks of life, no matter their income, race, whatever, they hear, they enjoy it. I hardly ever hear a, a harsh word out here or on the buses even late at night when people are going home. So I love the fair because it represents uh, grassroots uh, people, uh, Minnesota, represents what, well, this country's about. Where we started, how we got here, from 4-H and the egg up to, uh, you know, the new rides every year. So it's quintessential Americana. There's a history here, there's a story here, it's connection. It tells a story of people in the state. By being at the State Fair, you are demonstrating to the public that the Minnesota Legislature is an open place. Why is it important for legislators to hear from the public? Well, we represent the whole state, and that's one of the things I like about the State Fair booth, is that I get to see people and talk to people from all over the state of Minnesota, not just my district. And uh, there's, there's a variety of different opinions on, you know, depending on what part of the state. I think in the legislature, uh, sometimes it's almost more where you're from, the region, than it is the party that you end up with in arguments on the floor or where you stand on things. So I think it's a great opportunity that um, everybody should be exposed to everything in the state. It's important because it makes you a well-rounded representative of the people. Uh, I get many emails, phone calls, uh, those are the primary modes of communication, but when you have those casual conversations, whether it's here at the state senate booth or over at one of the political booths, uh, you really get to talk with Minnesotans and find out what they're really thinking about in a much more casual atmosphere. I think it makes you a better senator or representative as a result. If we don't hear from the public, we are missing a tremendous resource in order to form our opinions about legislative policy proposals that come before us. I myself have listening sessions sometimes twice a month just at a, just at a local bar on Saturday mornings where people can come in and they talk and I try to listen. Uh, there's no set agenda, they just come and let me know what they're thinking about on, on any given Saturday morning when we hold them. And they're, my, they're, they're a, just a tremendous source of information to me uh, to learn what's, what's on people's minds. Well, that's what we're here to do, right? It's a people business. One of the first things uh, someone told me, the prior uh, senator in this Republican center in the district, said it's a people business. It's a people business. If you're not out talking to people and getting to know them, uh, you're not doing your job. Now, I can't talk to 80,000 uh, constituents in the district, but look, we're people. The pants go on one leg at a time. We're not wearing crowns or capes. We're our normal folks. So. Uh, so um, we, um, it's important to get out and talk with people, and I think it's extremely important. I 
I like to go to the, I like to call it the pubs, right? There's a couple in the district I go to where I feel comfortable and that's where people go and they live and they talk and eat and they share their thoughts and play bingo. So why should we do it? It's what we're supposed to do. It's what we're about. If you're not doing it, I would dare say that's one reason we have a lot of trouble today. Well, I think at the State Fair, we see people from all across the state. And so those of us who come from one district, we get to meet people from Duluth, from Mankato, uh, Chatfield, uh, Stillwater, all over the state. And when they come here and come through this booth, um, I talked to somebody actually now from London, here with his parents, and he has roots in Minnesota. So um, that's a very unique thing, and it's important for the legislature to get that very broad exposure for us as legislators, and then also for the staff as well. It's very, very valuable and precious. It's absolutely, keep your, keep your ear to the ground, keep your focus on what's happening, and you got everybody from all over the state coming in here. We have one of the largest state fairs in the nation, right? I mean, when you talk about population-wise, we always talk about, we beat last year's numbers, we beat last year's numbers, right? That every year we seem to beat last year's numbers. But what this does is it gives people a, an opportunity to voice their opinion on some questions that, that actually in the past, and if you talk to some of the folks that have been here for a long time that do these surveys, um, a lot of these survey questions turn into potential bills, which some of them have turned into law. So, you know, make an influence, come here. Plus, you get to talk one-on-one -on -one with some legislators to really voice your opinion. This is, should be an open process, right? The other thing, Minnesota, when you look at the number of senators that we have, each senator represents 80,000 people, right? If we were California, each senator, each state senator represents like 850,000 people. So Minnesota has a long history and a tradition of keeping our constituents close to the action. And this just gives one more example of transparency and close to the action and come voice your opinion and be heard. In today's technology-based social media world, what is the best way for someone to communicate with their legislator? What works best for you? The best way for someone to communicate with me? A handwritten letter, period. The best way, because you know it's funny, we get emails, and, and, I, and I knew this on, when I was on the school board, uh, my record was 7,000 emails in one month, and they were all, you know, from a canned type, of, and, and, and to weed out the ones that were from somebody individually versus, you know, some organization that did it, um, it, was, it was hard to do. But what stops me in my tracks, what makes me sit down at my desk and go, wow, is if somebody writes a handwritten note. Uh, I really like email because uh, if there's something that somebody needs, if they have a problem with a school, if they have a problem, I just I, I get emails all the time about a road issue. Somebody had a problem with one of the yellow blinking lights on uh, up in part of my district. Um, emails are so efficient because I can answer those emails any day of the week, any time of the day, and also be able to direct my legislative assistant just simply by forwarding it and commenting on what I need them to do. I think that's probably the best and most efficient way. Phone calls always work and letters are always good, but you know, email is the, we're in the electronic age and that electronics really gives you the opportunity to talk to your legislator, whether it's about a specific issue that they need help with or whether we're even sitting on the Senate floor and we're voting on a bill, people will send me comments through an email saying, I really like this bill or I really don't or why are you gonna vote a certain way? Yeah, you know, I, when I talk to people on my, on my card, my cell phone's on it. So I give my card, you can call me. If you don't want to call me, send me a text. Um, so in the social uh, media world, call me, send me a text. If that fails, get a hold of, you know, send an email or call the office. We try to respond to everything. I think personal emails and uh, text, I, I really, I try to, Give up, get out my um, cell phone so that people can text me. I, I pay attention to that. A lot of them do the, uh, what do they call that, instant messaging from Facebook. Yeah, I have quite a bit of contact with um, my community on Facebook and uh, Twitter. I would say anyway, whatever's convenient for you. For some of our senior citizens, a phone call works better for them. But they're getting really savvy with technology. So whether it's Facebook, email, Twitter, Snapchat, I don't do as much, but I think um, email, phone calls are the most difficult one because the staff time it takes to listen to it and interpret it versus an email or um, is probably, because it's in writing, 
and we can respond back. Be amazed how many people call my office and, and ask for a phone call and don't leave a phone number. And so that makes it a little bit harder, but I always say any way it takes to let us know, um, we're, we're glad to hear from you. I think people would like to think it's by writing a letter, but actually it's through emails. And it's through emails that are personal, that are short, and that are not canned um, robot emails, uh, you know, 500 words long that 100 people send you. Uh, that is not, that is not a way of communicating. That's a, that is, that is a robot behavior. Uh, I would much rather have somebody just send me an email saying, um, didn't like your vote on such and such and such and such. I think you're wrong in that. And, um, you know, hope you'll change your mind. I like that kind of email and I respond. Or sometimes when people say, I like what you're doing, I just say, send back an email that says, thanks. Attorneys representing Governor Mark Dayton and the Minnesota Legislature responded to tough questions from the Supreme Court justices this week. The justices will decide whether Governor Dayton's line item veto of legislative funding was constitutional. When the special session of the legislature ended, the governor had an executive decision to make. Although he liked many of the things in the 10 omnibus bills that were presented, there were things he did not agree with. And the question was, how do I continue negotiation with the legislature on those issues with the least disruption of government? His only tool to continue negotiation was his veto power, and, and it offered him three options. The first was he could have vetoed the entire government appropriation bill, but this would be massively disruptive it's what was done in 2011. At that time, 19,000 employees were laid off. He could have vetoed the tax bill. This would be substantially disruptive because the legislature had built into the government appropriations bill a poison pill that if Council, he vetoed can we, just, the, can we just get to it? Um, if it's constitutional, as you suggest, for the governor to take away funding for the legislature, why is it constitutional for the judiciary to give the money back to the legislature? First, I would disagree with your premise, Your Honor. The gover governor did not take away funding from the legislature. He vetoed their appropriation knowing that they had funding if, available. If it's constitutional for the governor to veto the legislature's appropriation, why is it constitutional for the judiciary to, in effect, undo that veto by restoring funding, or some funding, to the legislative branch? I think it is not constitutional for the court to restore the funding. I think the court has, uh, if we're addressing the political question, I think there is a political case and a pol political question involved here. This is a political case that comes up in a political environment. The court does have jurisdiction, we believe, to decide whether the veto is authorized by the Constitution. That's something the court has decided in the Johnson case, in the Duxbury case, in the interfaculty case. But we don't believe the court has jurisdiction to decide why the governor exercised his veto if it determines that it was authorized by the Constitution. But if we rule in your favor, doesn't that mean that some future gov governor could defund the judiciary or that some future legislature could defund the judiciary? They couldn't defund because the court has the ability to again, provide so core funding. We're back to that again. So, so defunding, I think, is an improper word that has been used throughout this case, and there is no defunding. Funding is available. The governor can, uh, can uh, veto an appropriation, which is not the same as funding. It, funding can come from an appropriation, but it doesn't have to. I, I watched your argument in the district court, and in that argument, I think you conceded the governor could have vetoed the entirety of SF1. The, the state government appropriations bill. Now that also would have zeroed out the legislature because the legislature was in SF1. 
Correct. So <clears throat> what's your rule of law that you're proposing that it would be constitutional to veto the whole thing, including zeroing out the legislature, but unconstitutional to line item veto the legislature? And, and the, like, net, the net effect is the same, isn't it? And it could have added the same five conditions for calling a special session. It's very different, and let me explain why. When you veto the bill, you veto the whole bill, both sides lose what they had in the bill. They were compromised. Governor had things he wanted. Uh, the legislature had things it's wanted. And you veto it, you're back to square one. Okay, what do we do? Yeah, and they negotiate in the political process to get it. When you have a line item veto, the line item veto takes one item out and the rest becomes law. And so you are really, the line item veto is, is, is very pernicious in that way. It's almost, you can make You're law that way. You're just saying it's, it's just not fair, it's dirty pool? Well, it, it, no, what I'm saying is it's different than this because you, you do not go back to how, the political how process. How legally is it different? Is there anything in the Constitution that says you can do it in a general veto, but you can't do it in a line item veto. Especially when yes. it's the same result. Yes, there are many things you but, can't do counsel, in a line item veto. Excuse but it's me, the same Honor. result because you've been you've been articulating using the district court's language that the line item veto abolished the legislature. Given the um, uh, question by Justice Lillehog, it's the same result. So no, it's not the same result, Your Honor, because of the manner in which it's involved in the political process. If you, if he, had, if the governor had vetoed it, we would not be here today. I believe if the governor vetoes that bill, they have to go back and they have to come to some kind of an agreement, and I believe they would have. But under the way that this was done, after it was done and without the ability to come back into a special session, now this is law and my clients have no ability to defend themselves as they would have if there had been a general veto. Throughout your brief and throughout um, the complaint uh, in count one, the declaratory judgment uh, part of the complaint, there's language about the governor coercing the, uh, the legislature and abolishing the legislature to coerce it into repealing policy legislation and uh, using the line item veto to control, coerce, restrain the actions of the legislature in the exercise of its constitutional powers and duties. And what just strikes me as odd here is that isn't that exactly what the legislature did by including the poison pill? It, it was an attempt to control, coerce, restrain the action of the executive branch in the exercise of its constitutional powers. Uh, but it didn't. And, and listen, the governor had a remedy, and I don't want to sound repetitive, but all he had to do was veto it, and we'd be back into the political process and things could go on. Join us again next week as we delve into more topics affecting Minnesotans. I'm Shannon Lurkey, and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, thanks for watching.